as you continue your study of justification by faith alone, what we call sola fide, you will eventually encounter some devil who objects that the doctrine of justification by faith alone is a legal fiction. Usually this objection comes from a Roman Catholic, but sometimes it will proceed from the mouth of one professing to be reformed. Regardless, the objection is easily answered. Let's consider this objection. The plan of Antichrist is to reject the Calvinist doctrine of justification based on the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ alone, received by faith alone, and to replace it with the evil doctrine of justification by an infused righteousness. To do this, Antichrist begins by wrongly claiming that no one can be justified before God without the basis of justification being located within the person who is to be justified. In other words, the righteousness of Christ infused into the individual along with that individual's good works that follow this transfusion form the basis of justification before God in the Roman Catholic scheme. This is justification by faith and works and it logically contradicts Romans chapter 3 verse 28 which reads, and I quote, a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law." End quote. But Antichrist does not care to contradict the Bible, for the papacy has always claimed to be the only one who has the right to interpret Scripture. That being said, the papacy concludes their attack on the Bible by claiming that it is a lie, a legal fiction for God to justify a sinner when there is no adequate basis in the sinner. In response to this heresy, I will read an excerpt from an article edited by Dr. John W. Robbins. Robbins writes the following, and I quote, The Reformation principle of justification by faith alone always points to the saving realities that are completely outside of man. Grace is pure mercy that is outside of man in the heart of God. The righteousness that justifies is outside of man. For it is the obedience which Jesus Christ performed 2,000 years ago. In justification, this righteousness is not infused, but imputed. It is not in man, who is on earth, but in Christ, who is in heaven. Faith justifies, not because it has any intrinsic merit, but solely because it is the only instrument that accepts and can accept the imputed gift. Justification by faith alone means that I live in the favor of God by the righteousness which is found in another. It means to be accepted as righteous because another is righteous. In every way, it leads me, quote, to the rock which is higher than I, end quote. What happens in Romanism is that everything is internalized. The words grace, righteousness, justification, substitution, may remain, but they no longer have the objective meaning. The work of the Holy Spirit in us is substituted for the work of Christ for us as the cause of pardon and acceptance. The inward renewal of the believer is put in the place of the imputed righteousness of Christ. God's transforming act in man displaces God's redemptive act for man. The focus of attention is not outward, but inward not in heaven, at the right hand of God, but in the cave of the heart, and in the new interior life. What remains objective in Romanism is not the work of Christ, but the work of the Antichrist and his priests, which Rome calls the Church. We deal with Rome at the head of all the religious isms, because she is the mother of the abominations of the earth. See Revelation 17 verse 5. It is this system which most perfectly epitomizes all false religions. Every devious ism can find its true home here, for the common denominator of all false religion is its preoccupation with the interior life of the worshiper." End quote. That was quoted from Against the Churches, the Trinity Review, 1989 through 1998. Essay 126, page 302. Well, John Robbins is correct. The only legal basis for our justification before God is the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. This is why Jesus is called the Lord our righteousness. 
Jeremiah 23, verse 6. Notice that Jeremiah does not call Jesus the Lord partly our righteousness. Jeremiah was not a Roman Catholic, nor was the Apostle Paul, for he correctly wrote the following, and I quote, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. End quote. Philippians chapter 3 verses 8 through 9. Notice that Paul does not say that he will be found having some of the righteousness of Christ and some of his own righteousness. But Paul clearly says that he will only be found having the righteousness of God, that is, the perfect righteousness of Christ imputed to him and received by faith alone. Paul never points to anything in him as a basis for his justification before God. The only basis of our justification is what Christ did for us. And what Christ did for us was real, not a fiction. Christ really obeyed the law for us in order for us to be just. The Bible says, quote, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. End quote. Romans chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. Again, the Bible says that Christ obeyed for us when we read the following, and I quote, By the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. End quote. Romans chapter 5, verse 19. Now, since it is not the sinner's obedience and righteousness that is imputed, then it must be the obedience and righteousness of Christ that is imputed to the sinner. Notice that Paul says that it is only the obedience of one that justifies us before God. If our justification was based partly on what Christ did and partly on what we do, then Paul would have to have said that by the obedience of two shall many be made righteous. But like I said, Paul was no Roman Catholic. The suffering and death of Jesus Christ was no legal fiction, for the Bible says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. End quote. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4, 5, and 12. For Antichrist to claim that justification by faith alone is a legal fiction is for Antichrist to assert that the covenant of grace is also a legal fiction. James Buchanan writes the following. And I quote, If we have reason to believe, as we have endeavored to prove, that he promulgated his law in a covenant form, as a law for the race at large, and imposed it on the first Adam as their representative, then that constitution may, or rather must, be productive of results in which they, as well as he, will be found to participate. And yet these consequences, so far from being mere legal fictions, are assuredly very solemn realities. The curse pronounced on the ground, the doom of universal death, the loss of God's image, the forfeiture of his favor, the depravity of human nature, and all the evils and sufferings which have followed in the train of sin, all these are brought upon us under the operation of that law, and every one of them is as real as it is dreadful. In like manner, if we have reason to believe, as we have endeavored to prove, that he has promulgated a scheme of redeeming mercy, and this too in a covenant form, through the second Adam as the representative of his people, imposing on him the fulfillment of its conditions, and securing to them the benefits of his work on their behalf, then this constitution also may, or rather must, be productive of results in which they as well as he will be found to participate. And yet these results, so far from being mere legal fictions, are substantial blessings of the highest and most permanent kind, the pardon of sin, the restoration of God's favor, the renewal of his image, 
the assurance of his love, the privilege of adoption, and the gift of eternal life. All these are brought upon us under the operation of that scheme, and every one of them is as real as it is desirable. When we are brought face to face with such realities as these, it is vain to talk of legal fictions, whether under the law or under the gospel. For while condemnation on the one hand and justification on the other are strictly forensic or judicial acts, and must necessarily have some relation to the law and justice of God, and yet while the representative character both of the first and the second Adam, and the consequent imputation of their guilt and righteousness to those whom they respectively represented can only be ascribed to the sovereign will and appointment of God, yet the results are in their own nature real and true, and not in any sense fictitious or imaginary. The Doctrine of Justification pages 336 through 337. All right, so let me conclude this video by saying again that justification by faith alone is no legal fiction, for our justification before God is based only on the perfect and vicarious life and death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.